When you want to perform operations on a list or want to perform a calculation that involves repetition, the first thing that probably comes to mind is to use a for loop. And that makes sense, they are intuitive to use, versatile and come with very little overhead. But sometimes you will run into a problem that doesn't quite lend itself to using for loops or any loop in that regard. And you're better off using something else. Recursion. Problems regarding tree-like data structures or linked lists tend to be so recursive in nature that an iterative approach sometimes is basically a recursive one with extra steps. And although most people have already come up with well-performing solutions to these problems, sometimes you have to figure things out on your own. So how do we improve a skill that we rarely use to begin with? Well, it's simple, by intentionally practicing it. And that's where Haskell comes in. Haskell makes recursion a common thing by making it the only choice you have. And it has some neat tricks up its sleeve to deal with some of the overhead. Let's see how Haskell approaches recursion by writing a factorial function. The factorial of a number is defined as the product of every natural number up to that number, with the factorial of 0 just being 1. So for example, the factorial of 4 written 4 exclamation mark would be 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, or just 4 times 3 times 2 when you simplify. When writing any function, it's generally good practice to write down the type of the function first, because the compiler and language server can give you more relevant feedback when the type of the function is known. In our case, we take one integer argument, and the return type is an integer as well, so our type will be integer to integer. There are lots of ways to think about recursion, but Graham Hutton came up with a robust way of defining recursive functions in his series on functional programming. We already completed the first step in this procedure, naming and typing our function. After naming our function and giving it a type, we should write down all cases that the arguments in our function can have. For every argument, there should be a simple case or base case and a recursion case. A base case is a case with no recursive calls. Since we want to include zero in our input space, that will also be our only base case. A recursion case will simply be when n is any other number, so we just write down n. You can see how pattern matching allows us to make this definition a lot more straightforward. The next step is to define these cases, starting with the base case. The base case will just be equal to 1, as we said, the factorial of 0 should be equal to 1. And a recursion case should consist of recursive calls with parameters that close in on the base case. So, in our situation this would be n-1. It should be obvious then that we write our recursion case as n times factorial of n-1 because in the end, this will multiply n with every number that's smaller than itself. And that's our final code. This was a very simple example and we will take a look at some more involved ones in a moment, but before that we need to talk about lists. Haskell lists are what we call linked lists. Unlike lists in most languages, which dynamically allocate or free up a contiguous region of memory to deal with the size limit, linked lists create a node for every element which is a pointer to the next node in the list. In most cases you tend to avoid linked lists, because these nodes can become very spread out in memory, which hurts cache utilization when working on lists sequentially. But sometimes you are better off using them, so again, Haskell helps to keep your blades sharp here. Let's make a list of the numbers 1 to 3. We can use the syntax we are all familiar with to write lists to the roles, especially if you are used to using Python. The type of this list is simply integer within square brackets, which should explain itself. But under the hood, our list actually looks more like this. Haskell lists are defined using cons and the empty list, or nil. Cons links a node to the remaining list, and nil marks the end of the list, or just an empty list. To operate on lists, we again use recursion. For example, say we want to write a function that calculates the sum of a list of numbers. We can use the numType class and a type variable to generalize the type for all numbers. Now, following Hutton's method, we should write down our cases, but what do these even look like? Well, we need to go through every element in our list, so our recursion should end when we reach the end of the list, aka when the input is an empty list, or nil. Therefore, our base case will look like this. Okay, but then what about a recursion case? Well, if we look at the definition of a Haskell list, 
The only other thing we can pattern match on is something with cons. And it helps to think of cons not as an operator here, but as a data structure that looks like this. Here x is our current element and x is the remaining list. You can name these whatever you want, but x and x's or y's and y's and so on is what's conventional. So now our recursion case would look like this. On to defining the cases, for our base case the sum of our empty lists is just zero. And for the recursion case, we can actually use x and x's in our expression to calculate the sum. This will simply be the value of x added to the sum of the remaining list. Okay, let's take a look at one more example. Take is a function that takes a number of elements from the beginning of a list. So take three a, b, c, d, e would just return the list a, b, c. Again, start with the function name and type. We have two arguments this time, an integer indicating the number of elements to take and a list with elements of any type. The return type is simply a smaller list of the same type. And since we don't care about the type of the elements, we can use the type variable to allow lists of all types to be passed into this function. Now for our cases. Unlike previously, we have two arguments that are involved in the recursion now. We should make sure that every combination of base or recursion cases for each argument is taken care of, so we write down four cases. When we take zero elements from any list, we get an empty list. And likewise, when we take any number of elements from an empty list, we get an empty list as well. So our first three cases will simply evaluate to an empty list. And for the last case, we should return a cons of some sort. If we want to take n elements from a list and n is greater than zero, we know the first element of that list should be x. This should then be followed by the next n minus one elements in the remaining list. We can therefore write our recursion case like this. So we are done, right? But you might have already spotted that we seem to have some repetition in our code. And this is where the last tip of Hutton's method comes in. Generalize and simplify. In our example, if the first argument is zero, an empty list is returned no matter what. And the same goes for when the list is empty. We can therefore rewrite these cases into the following two. The underscores are nameless arguments and match all values for that argument. Because we don't need the value of the list or the number in our base cases, we don't need to give them a name, so that makes this code a bit cleaner. But what about performance? Doesn't all of this mean that Haskell is incredibly slow? And yeah, the short answer is yes. Recursion will always be slower than an iterative solution if it exists. But remember that we're doing this to improve our skills for those cases where we have no alternative. Regardless, Haskell still tries his best to improve performance wherever possible. One of the optimizations used is what we call lazy evaluation. Suppose we have the following code. Here, square all squares all elements in a list and returns it. When you look at this code, you might think we're doing some unnecessary calculations since we square the entire list and then only return the first n elements. However, this code performs just as well as if we did the operations in reverse. Haskell does not evaluate an expression until strictly necessary. So square all x's doesn't really return a list of squares. Rather, it returns the expression that calculates that list and passes it on to the take function. It will then take the first n elements in that expression, giving us the final return value. When the values are needed, only n elements get squared, even though the square all function was called first. There's another benefit of lazy evaluation that isn't performance related. Look at this list. This list contains all natural numbers. It is an infinitely long list. And this is possible because the next element of this list is only evaluated when it is actually needed. Under the hoods, it looks more like the following. And this makes certain kinds of mathematics way easier to represent in Haskell compared to other languages. Haskell is not the only language to feature lazy evaluation, but it is a way more integral part of the language than it is elsewhere. Now we're of course using recursion to practice it, but sometimes you just want to do a simple operation on a list without having to bother with recursion and everything. And this is where list comprehensions can be very helpful.
If you know Python, you probably already know what this is, although the syntax is a bit different. Basically, a list comprehension applies a function or expression to every element in a list. For example, the square all function from before can be written like this. And this is a lot simpler than writing the same function recursively. I recommend you try writing some other recursive functions to get used to these concepts. I wrote down a few exercises you can try yourself. Next time, we'll be looking at how we can generalize some of these common recursive patterns in what we call higher order functions. Until then, stay inspired and have a good one.